good mor good mor oh. Hi, everybody. It's an honor to welcome you to another year of Vancouver's Writers Fest. My name is Chief Ian Campbell. I'm from the Squamish Nation. It's an honor to welcome you to the shared territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh families. We are here on Granville Island, next to our ancient village of Snock. And we're going to have an awesome year. Welcome, everybody. Hoichika, Osiem. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Dembicki Polivka, and I'm the festival's food and beverage manager this year. Welcome to Masterclass, the best way to get your way with Tanya Lloyd Kai. We're so pleased you could join us all here today. This event is also being live streamed to classrooms across the province and beyond, so hello to everyone joining us from afar. Uh, before we begin, I just have some notes to deliver. Please silence your phones during the event. Later this evening, you'll receive a feedback survey by email. Please take a moment to complete it and share your thoughts. We rely on this feedback and we read every response. Following the event, the book sales are happening in the lobby and Tanya will be signing books just over here. Thank you to all of our volunteers and supporters, especially our title sponsor, CMHC Granville Island, and all of our government funders. This year, the Festival Bookstore is located at the end of a Cartwright Street in Origins Coffee. Please now allow me to introduce Tanya Lloyd Kai. Tanya Lloyd Kai is the author of more than 30 books for children and young adults. She writes about science, pop culture, and places where the two overlap. Her recent projects include Our Green City, This Is Your Brain on Stereotypes, and the middle grade novels Me and Banksy and Maya's Strategy to Save the World. Tanya is also a lecturer with the UBC School of Creative Writing. Tanya lives in Vancouver with her husband and two teenagers and a small mischievous puppy. Today, Tanya joins us with the best way to get your way. Please join me in welcoming Tanya Lloyd Kai. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. I am going to switch microphones. can walk around and talk at the same time because I'm not very good at standing still and we have our our final class has finally made it so they're going to interrupt us in a minute and they're going to come on in but I am very excited to be here today to talk about the best way to get your way which is really a book all about how to argue um, I don't know why I wrote it when I had two teenagers because they just thought it was a guide to how to argue with me That doesn't look quite right. Let's try again. There we go. So these are my two teenagers. This is Matthew, who is in grade 11 at Prince of Wales now. And that is Julia, who is off at France in university. And most importantly, that is my dog, Kobe, who sits at my feet. So really, really should have like a co-author credit on all of these books. And these are the types of books I write. I write some picture books. I write lots of books for 8 to 12 year olds. Some of them are fiction, novels. And some of them, like this one we're going to be talking about today, are nonfiction information books. And I love writing both for different reasons. But today, I'm going to talk first about some of the reasons I love writing information books and some of the types of stories I look for for those information books. And then we're going to get specifically into this, the best way to get your way, and we're going to talk about making arguments. Are we ready? ready. OK, come on in. Do you feel like special guests are arriving now and we should give them a round of applause as they come in or something? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> no problem, I'm glad you made it. Thank you, we're excited. Buses, buses to events are always adventures, right? Yes. Hi.
Okay, we got everybody. Welcome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I find the stories for my books and what kind of stories I look for. And when I'm starting to think about a book, see that, that person in the top corner of this slide? That's me if I had like the hair that I always dreamed of having. Um, but when I start thinking about a topic, I start looking in all sorts of places for as much information as I can find. I read grown-up books about the topic, I listen to podcasts, I watch YouTube videos, I try to find everything, I try to find out everything. And then I start to pick the specific things that I think might be interesting for kids to read in the books. And when I have those specific things, I go looking for the scientific research. So I read a bunch of really boring science journals and I try to find the interesting bits of those. Sometimes they are not at all interesting. Um, and sometimes I find things in them that I think, well, maybe like how they did this experiment was, was interesting. Or maybe this little part is interesting, but I need to know more about it. And then what I do is I email the scientists. And I say to them, these are the magic words, I say to them, I am writing a book for 8 to 12 year old or 8 to 13 year old readers, and I think they're going to be fascinated by what you're researching. Can you help me? And then they all say yes, because scientists secretly think that all 8 to 13 year old readers should be fascinated by what they're researching. So then I email back and forth with the scientists a little bit, and then I, write, then I start writing up their stories. So what I'm looking for is stories that I know for sure are true. I'm looking for stories that are as interesting as possible. And usually I'm looking for stories that will make people think. Those are the ones that are most interesting to me. So when I'm looking for true stories, I have a little bit of a quiz here. I have a bunch of places where you might find a true story. And I'm going to ask you if you think that this would be a reliable place for me to get my information from if I was going to put it in a book. So here is number one. If I was looking at this website, the sporting blog, the nine greatest equestrians of all time, could I be absolutely sure that this was true? Give me a thumbs up if you think yes, 100% true, and a thumbs down if you think absolutely not, and you can give me a middle thumbs if you're not sure. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of maybes to no's. Yeah, not really, because who knows who wrote this? Blogs are not reliable sources, and the person who wrote this is maybe not the, um, the expert of all equestrians everywhere. So not no to blogs for stuff that goes into my books. What about Wikipedia? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Mostly, I got lots of middles here. A few ups, a few downs, and lots of middles, which is exactly how I feel about Wikipedia. Super, super interesting, sometimes useful to find interesting stuff, but not entirely trustworthy. What is trustworthy is at the bottom of the Wikipedia article are all these sources. So sometimes if I do see something interesting in a Wikipedia article, I can go find the source and actually the science and then go look for that. Okay, how about this one, NASA? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yes, thumbs up to NASA. So anything that's gover a government website or a university website, it gets the thumbs up. I'm allowed to use all of those. How about, this sounds very serious, preschool home literacy practices and children's literacy development, a longitudinal analysis. This is a science journal. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yes. And these are some of the best sources because when scientists write for science journals, the journals take their work and they send it to a bunch of other scientists to check their work. It's like having your work, you know, if you pass your math worksheets and other people check it for you, it's a bit like they, the scientists have to do that. So those, those get a big thumbs up. How about the Scholastic website, Building Language and Literacy Through Play? That sounds pretty official. What do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down? This one's a bit tricky. I see lots of thumbs up and a few medium and down. This one's a bit of a trick because this is probably true. What they're saying here, probably true. But Scholastic is a company, and companies' main jobs are to make money. Their main jobs are not to check that everything's true. Their main jobs are to make money. So when I'm choosing book information for one of my books, I can't trust a website from a company that's main job is to make money. That was a trick one. 
Okay, how about this? This is the National Gallery of Canada, and this is an original sketch from an artist. What do you think, for to, for, to original sketches, things like diary entries, things in museums? Yeah, I see lots of thumbs up. Yes, thumbs up to those, because those were made by real people. Original materials, sketches, archival photos, diaries, those all count as good places for me to get my information. Okay, so here's the question for you. It's Halloween. Your little brother says your Halloween candy is poisonous. Do you believe him? Thumbs up or thumbs down? No. No? Nobody believes their little brother? Oh, somebody, somebody believes him. Okay, wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask some questions here. You in the back in the hoodie, why do you believe your little brother when he says your Halloween candy is dangerous? It's good to be trusting of your family members. What if he says your Halloween candy is poisonous, but only to you? You better give it all to me to be safe. You still trust him? No. <laughs> I guess it all depends on how much you trust your brother, right? And how trustworthy he's proven in other parts of your life. Um, OK, who would you trust? Who would you trust if somebody says, oh, sorry, all the Halloween candy is poisonous this year? Who would you trust? I see some hands up in the very back row. Over there, who would you trust? Yeah. Ah, mom and dad? How about in the black, just in front? Yep, you're looking behind you. Yep. I would trust my mom, because my dad's probably trying to steal my candy. Trust you. trap in my piggy bag, so I just trust my dad. You would trust your mom, but your dad would be trying to steal your candy, so no trusting dad. All right. That's a good example of like learning from past experiences. Um, how about how about you in the in the white shirt there? Oh, you trust yourself. And beside? Pardon me. Say that again. Your taste buds. You're gonna test. You're gonna try go uh, to experiment on the possibly poisonous candy. How about any official sources anybody would trust? How about you in the red jacket? Yeah. Oh, okay, so you don't eat much candy and you don't have a little brother, so it's not applicable, but you'd believe your dad. Okay, anybody have an official source that they would believe if they said that the candy was poisonous? Yes. Uh, I saw this book that had like six pages. I was like, 90% of parents feel their kids Halloween candy. <laughs> Ninety percent of parents steal their kids Halloween candy. No. You are all very, very hesitant to part with your Halloween candy, even with official sources. Okay, one last try in the purple. Do you have an official source? Uh, like if we just get Vancouver, like some that they have like some information, or like the Vancouver Canada, like the doctor. Right, that's a very good idea. So if the city of Vancouver said Halloween candy is poisonous, or if a big association of doctors said that Halloween candy is poisonous, then we might consider those good sources. That is a very good point, yes. Um, this is a page from the book we're talking about today, and this is about whether you would, the one part is about whether Halloween candy is safe or not, the other part is whether if you hear aliens are attacking, who might you believe? And the trustworthy sources might be, like we looked at, NASA, an astrophysicist at Harvard University, maybe a big respected newspaper like the New York Times. Not so good sources, my alien encounter blog post, your friend Ethan, the aliens or us social media page. Yeah, so, so in real life, just like when I'm choosing stories for my books, we have to work really hard to figure out what's true and what's not true, and we have to choose the most reliable sources we can find. So that's one of the things I work on really hard when I'm writing these books. Now, the other thing that I really want to find for my books is interesting stories. I want them to be the most interesting stories possible. 
And I have the kind of brain that when I'm sleuthing around social media or the internet and I find weird things, I remember them. So here are a few of the weird types of things I find. Escaped petting zoo camel attacks and kills two men in Tennessee. The Jurassic vomit that stood the test of time. That is like fossilized dinosaur vomit. And a sideways scooting robot crab is so tiny it fits through the eye of a needle. I know. So I haven't written books about any of these things yet. But I keep them all stored away in my brain. And then if a book comes up that relates, then I'm like, what did they say about that sideways crab? And I go looking, not for the blog posts about it, not for these posts about it, but I go looking for like the journal articles about it. Because there are scientific journal articles about dinosaur throw up. And so I go looking for those. I'm going to tell you, we're going to be talking as we talk about debating a little bit about stress. And so this is an example of one of the fun and interesting stories I found when I was researching the history of stress research. And sometimes when you research scientists from the 1920s, it's not very interesting. But this guy, his name was Walter Cannon. He worked at Harvard in the 1920s. He wasn't actually researching stress at all. He was researching cat digestion. So he had given a cat some food, and then he had put it under an x-ray machine, and he was watching the food go through the cat's digestive tract. When, slam, somebody slammed the door in the lab, and the cat's digestion stopped. And Walter thought, that is very odd, because are the ears, are your ears connected to your digestive tract? No. no. So he thought, that's strange, must be a coincidence. So he waited a little while, and the cat's digestion started again. But then he made a loud noise himself this time, bang, and the cat's digestion stopped. And Walter was so fascinated that he basically abandoned digestion research altogether and started researching how we react when we're startled. And he, he's the guy who discovered the fight or flight reflex, when, when something, when a car comes around a corner really fast at us, or when a saber-toothed tiger jumps out of the bushes at us, our hands go up and our pupils dilate, and we get ready either to run away or to fight. And he's the guy who discovered that, all because he was researching the digestion of cats. The other thing that I always think makes things really fun is if I get a little bored when I'm doing research and I'm like, hmm, I need more interesting stories. These ones aren't working for me. I always look to see what they're doing in space. So we can look at how they're researching sleep in space or how are they re researching stress in space. In this experiment, they, they did all the scanning to see how two men in the International Space Station stressed each other out over the space of a year. Now the third type of story I look for is stories that make me ask questions, and stories that I think might make other people ask questions. I like to talk about how science starts with people asking questions and coming up with theories and then testing those theories. So sometimes, for a little while, scientists think things that are wrong because they're, they're still questioning and they're still doing experiments to figure it out. And sometimes some scientists think one thing and the other scientists think another thing and they argue about it until they figure out something everybody can agree on. Sometimes there's, there's questions that have scientific, good scientific research on both sides. And both sides are reliable. And sometimes ideas change a lot over time. So those are the types of things I look for. There was um, one of my favorite things ever was the past CEO of Google said that our policy on privacy is to get right up to the creepy line and not cross it. He's like, we don't want to be creepy. Now, is creepy a scientific concept? No. no, there's nobody says what's creep. There's no one big expert who says what's creepy and what's not creepy. So that gave me all sorts of questions to, to answer. This, this book talks about this creepy question where in New York City, they have a neighborhood that's kind of like Yale Town, where all the buildings are these tall glass buildings, and everybody lives in apartments where you can see into everybody else's window. And a photographer came along, and he took pictures through the windows. He stood on the street, but he took pictures of people through their windows. And he put up his pictures in a gallery, and he called the exhibition The Neighbors. 
Well, the neighbors saw the exhibition and they said, oh, that's my bum in the gallery. Those are my feet in the gallery. That's not fair. He took pictures through our windows. My privacy has been invaded. And they took the photographer to court. What do you think? Is it okay to take pictures of people through their windows and put it in a gallery? Well, you know what? The court said, actually, if you're going to live in a glass house, then you have to be okay with people looking through the windows. Like, you could have closed your curtains. And the, the court said that the photographer was right. But the neighbors were not happy. Now, there's no one right or wrong answer to this. It's something everybody can talk about. So that's, that's the kind of story that I like most to find for my books. And this is the type of story I got to talk a about a lot in the best way to get your way, because it's all about debate. So I got to talk about one side of an issue and then another side of the issue. This, this chapter is all about whether screens are good for you or bad for you. So there's some research that says things like, mm, if you sit in front of the TV all the time, you get really out of shape, so that's bad for you. And other research that says, actually, people who play a lot of video games have really good hand-eye coordination. So sometimes they use um, video games to train doctors to do surgery. So there's some ways that screens are good for you. So there's lots of science on both sides and lots of things to think about, which was fun. Sometimes nobody knows the answer yet. So I wrote with my teenage daughter, I wrote a book about social media, and there were all sorts of things about social media that we disagreed on. I thought she shouldn't be allowed to have Instagram until she was in grade nine. She thought she should be allowed to have Instagram in grade seven. And we didn't know, there's no science that says this for sure is the answer. So we just put our arguments in the book. We said, this is what Julia thinks and this is what Tanya thinks. And you can decide for yourself. And then, this is one of my favorite things in it I've ever found for a book. This is in a book about sleep. And there was a doctor in the 1500s in Italy who said, if you can't sleep, I found the answer. You're going to take wax from your dog's ear, and then you're going to rub it on your front teeth, and that's going to help you drift blissfully off to sleep. What? Thumbs up to this technique? Yeah? No, that's disgusting. That's so gross. Who would put dog earwax on their teeth? That's gross. So no, and there is no scientific research saying that that was a good idea. But strangely, that same doctor was the guy who invented the combination lock. And we still use combination locks today. So sometimes a scientist has good ideas and very bad ideas. Same scientist. All right. So those are the types of arguments I like to make in my books. I'm going to move into the types of arguments I make in the best way to get your way. Let's see. I think I have some props. Let's see here. I think I'll see if I can find this prop over here. Oh, hmm, that must just be packing material, packing material. Oh, there's my travel mug. Wondered where that was. No, oh, no, not that. Hmm. Tupperware. Nope, nothing inside it. Hmm. Oh, yogurt. No. Hmm. Oh, what are my socks doing in here? That's okay. I'm in charge of this space this morning. It's fine. It's fine. We'll clean it up later. Hmm. Laundry. Oh. Oh. No, this isn't it. Ah. Well, I guess I'll leave that for later. Hmm. Oh, what a mess. Uh, I'll, clean, I'll clean it up in a little while. It's fine. It's fine. I'll clean it up in a little while. Okay, I need you to watch, I need you to watch this ping pong championship for a minute. Let's see if we can get it to play. Oh. oh, it's not gonna play for us. Oh well, we can watch ping pong later. Um, okay, here's the challenge though. So, the world championships of ping pong have happened. And now, they have buckets and buckets of extra ping pong balls. So, 
they've asked me if I can come up with ways to use ping pong balls. So I thought, well, that's great, because I'm doing a presentation. There's lots of great creative minds. We're going to come up with some ways to use, to reuse ping pong balls. So I'm going to ask you to think about this just in your own head for a minute. If you had buckets of extra used ping pong balls, what could you do with them? I'm going to ask you to combine forces with somebody beside you and see how many ideas you can come up with in one minute. Okay. All right. Bring your attention back up here. Who has some good ideas for me of ways to reuse ping pong balls? I saw sitting right beside Ms. Proden back there. I saw, yeah. Okay. Three ideas. Oh, teach a kid to count with them. Yep. Make art with them. Mu make a musical instrument. Cool. Okay, how about, how about you two in the blue shirts here? What ideas did you come up with? Oh, reuse it, shred up the plastic and make them into water bottles. Okay, I like it. Uh, one more from this side, how about you? Build walls out of ping pong balls. That would be so cool. Like, no, like, not like Encased in glass. Yeah, so they stood up. Yeah, I would have one of those in my house. Okay, how about over here on this side? Let's see. Um, yes. Uh, you could, uh, use, them like use them as packaging. That's a good idea. Like packing peanuts. How about you? Yeah. Oh, put like, ah, oh, put spikes on them so they fit together and build them like Lego. Yes, you in the gray hoodie there. Okay. Use them as snowballs, spray people with slush. Ping pong balls for violence. Got it. Great. Um, you in the blue at the very back. Uh, I made a ball set with the ping pong balls and people could play in it. Oh, a ball pit with ping pong balls. That would be fun. Okay. All right. Now, those to me seem like all very creative ideas. There was, there was a scientist named Kathleen Voss. I mean, she still is. She's alive. In 2019, did this big experiment at the University of Minnesota. And she asked a whole bunch of students to come into two separate rooms. And some of them, they would be like you over here. She asked them to come in a room where there was tables and chairs and there was pens and papers laid out very neatly. And then she asked a whole other group of students to come into a room that was a huge mess. Stuff everywhere. And they, and they were just sat at the tables. And then she asked everyone, please come up with as many ways as you can to, you, to reuse ping pong balls. And then they put all the answers through these, cis, these charts that rate how creative the answers were. And she found that the people in the messy room came up with much more creative and innovative ways to use ping pong balls. And then there was another, there was another experiment um, done by Paige Moreau at the Wisconsin School of Business and then 
Merit Gunderson, at a Norwegian professor of marketing. And they took a whole bunch of Lego. And they gave some people Lego that had been divided very carefully by color and shape and put in little baggies. So it was super organized. And then they gave other people just those big buckets of Lego that you know your grandma keeps at your house to entertain you when you go visit, all mixed up. And they said, please build something. And the people with the mixed up Lego built way more creative and interesting things. And they said that sometimes being messy leads to more divergent, oh, leads to more divergent thinking. So it helps us create things and invent things and discover things, imagine things, suppose things, hypothesize. Hypothesize means make guesses at things. So both those studies suggested that we might be better at all this kind of thinking, all this kind of creative thinking, if we are in spaces that are a little bit messy. Now, who knows who this guy is? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Super famous scientist, right? Won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1921. Um, pretty smart, creative guy. I don't understand the things he created, but he created, you know, fancy physics formulas. This is Albert Einstein's desk. If your teacher saw this at school, would your teacher say, clean up your desk? Yes. yes, I think nobody told Albert Einstein to clean up his desk. But he was one of the most creative scientists at, of all times. So people in messy rooms come up with more creative ideas. People with messy Lego are better at divergent creative thinking. Albert Einstein, super messy. So. Give me a thumbs up if you think it's a better idea to have a messy desk. Yes to messy desks? Yeah, right? Yeah. None of your teachers are ever going to bring you back to the Writers' Fest again. <laughs> okay, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I just gave you three arguments for the same side of the story. But there are a whole bunch of other arguments for the clean desk side of the story. <laughs> Sorry to whoever made that disappointed sound right now. <laughs> so, this is the University of Virginia in 2019. Researchers asked 10,000 kindergarten kids about their chores. And they found out that kindergartners who did chores were better at making friends, they were happier, and they earned better math grades. They were maybe just more organized people. Then Kathleen Voss, the same scientist who did that messy room ping pong ball experiment, she put a bunch of people in messy rooms and a bunch of people in clean rooms. And then she asked them if they would like to contribute to charity. And the students in clean rooms gave twice as much money to charity. Then she put them in messy rooms and clean rooms and gave them a menu and said, please order off this menu. And the people in clean rooms chose healthier smoothies from the menu. Maybe, she said, people in clean and organized rooms make better decisions. <laughs> and finally, there's this professor in Chicago named Joseph Ferrari who looked at teenagers and how messy their houses were and said that teenagers who live in clean houses are less likely to procrastinate, so they're better at getting things done. They make decisions more easily, and they feel more at home in their space. We all feel more, a little more relaxed when we're in a clean, like when they say, relax your mind, they don't say, relax your mind, picture a real big mess. They say, relax your mind, picture a clean beach. Um, so he said that we're gonna feel more at home and make decisions better and get stuff done better if we're in clean spaces. So now, Thumbs up for messy rooms. <laughs> Thumbs up for clean. Thumbs up for clean rooms. Who's on the clean room side? Oh, now we got about half and half. Half messy, half clean. There are very valid arguments on both sides of this issue. There is no there is no one right answer. Different rooms, different strategies work for different people. Now, every single time I write a book, 
there's one thing I find that I'm like, oh, I wish I'd seen that before, so I could have put it in the book. So here's my thing for this book. These Japanese researchers um, did a experiment to see what would best prompt people to clean up their desks. They said, would it be people saying, hey, clean up your desk now? Or would it be posters that says, everybody should have a clean desk? Or would it be a jiggle robot? And the answer was a jiggle robot. A robot, that little, a little box that sat on people's desks and jiggled to remind them to clean up their desks was the most effective way to make sure everybody in the office had clean desks. So now, I'm not sending you home and back to school saying you should have a messy desk, but I am sending you back to school saying you should really have a jiggle robot. <laughs> Okay, we are going to have a debate, a real live debate, about whether homework is a useful thing. And I have, I have asked a couple of the teachers to send me a couple debaters. So can I have Crosstown send me their debaters up? And then what school do we, what school do we have over here? Stratford Hall, can you send me your couple of debaters up? Okay. Thank you, debaters. Okay, come stand over here a little away from the mess. Face these, face your audience here. Now, I have to say that I am giving, I am giving these debaters their arguments. They're not researching themselves. If they re were researching themselves, I'm sure they would all come up with amazing arguments. Some of my arguments are good and some are not so good. Okay, so over here, Crosstown is on the side that homework should be useful. And over here, that homework is useful. And over here, we are on the side, Stratford Hall is on the side that all homework should be banned. You, you, may, you may have a small advantage in this debate. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've got, a, you've got a challenge here. You've got a challenge. All right. Um, which, would you like to go first? Okay. Give us, give us your argument. A German scientist studied 2,760 students in grades 5, 6, 7, and 8. Then he waited until they grew up and checked on them again. The one who put extra effort into their homework were happier, more successful people. We don't need to ban homework. We just need to give kids more options. Eric Patal at Universal of South Southern California assigned homework project to 100 teenagers. Then she let another 100 teenagers choose their own homework. The ones who got to choose their, were happier and got better grades. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to make you wait. What do you think? Choosing your own homework, would that help? Yeah. Okay, who's on the bench? Which one of you would like to go first? Yeah. Homework should be banned. Dr. Harris Cooper at Duke University is the world expert on homework. He says high school students can do up to two hours of homework a night. Junior high students can do one hour per night. Homework in elementary school has zero benefit. Yeah. 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 We can miss by that one, yeah? As we head to, into high school, our lives are going to get busy, even busier. We'll have basketball practices and part-time jobs and competitive hopscotch championships. What? <laughs> we need to learn to balance our time. Having a bit homework in elementary school helps us do that. There are hundreds of influencers, um, influencers on TikTok who love homework. For example, TikTok user at Danny Long Division says that homework made him who he is today and he has three million followers thank you all right 
What do you think of the argument that we need to learn to be organized when we get older? Good argument? Great argument. Oh, um, what do you think about Danny Long Division on TikTok? Good argument? All right, our final argument here. Homework should be banned. Kids in Finland are some of the top students in the world. They ace all the international tests every year. And Finland has some of the lowest homework rates in the world. Once, I was really busy. I did no homework and no studying. But then I aced a test. Based on my experience, everyone would do better on tests if they didn't study at all. Are you, con are you convinced? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, don't go away. Stay there for a second. Thank you. All right, can we have a round of applause for our debaters? Excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You were all great readers. You can go back to your, you can keep your arguments if you like. Those, that was pretty good. They were pretty good debaters. What, did anybody have one argument they found most convincing? Like, did anybody hear something that was like, yes, that is what's gonna convince me? What, did, what convinced you? The no homework side, was there anything on the no? What did you hear about not doing homework that you thought was really convincing? The people in Finland who do really well in school but don't do a lot of homework. That's a good one. How about you in the blue? Ah, they're having a choice in homework. Yep, good argument. In the back, in the black? So that argument about getting to choose and getting to choose where to put your time and when to study was the most convincing. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, how about you in the middle there? Yeah. You were convinced by the people who said homework was good? And the professional scientists, okay. Strong, okay, strong sources and good scientific research. And you in the red. And Yeah, again, so the German scientist who was actually studying real kids and finding if there was some benefit to homework was one of the most, one of the most um, convincing. Okay, those are all good points. Which arguments, which arguments were less convincing? Like, which ones made you, made you like, that's not a good argument? Yes. <laughs> so that wasn't the, the, the student who said I didn't study at all and I aced it, so nobody should do homework. That wasn't convincing. It was not convincing. Yeah, the, the personal personal stories can actually they can be useful in debates because sometimes they like pull at our heartstrings and sometimes we make decisions based on emotions. So debaters do use personal stories, but sometimes they're not convincing. We have to decide for ourselves. Um, anybody else hear an argument that was not convincing? How about you at the back in the back there? Ah, they did do some homework, yep, yep. Um, yes? The TikTok influencer? Yeah, not, not exactly a scientific study, right? Not exactly a scientific study. Incidentally, if anyone likes watching TikTok videos, my daughter has made me an account and is doing my TikTok videos for me, and it is very scary and embarrassing. So if you'd like to see me being scary and embarrassing, 
it's on TikTok. Um, the best arguments are the ones that are true, that have scientific research behind them, the ones that are interesting, and the ones that, are, that make us think, the ones that make us think most. Now, I wanted to say this book, this book is all about arguing, back and forth arguing. But I'm sure this will shock everybody, but sometimes people in my family think differently than I do. Sometimes not everyone agrees with me. And I have found one other thing about arguing, is that sometimes it's better not to. Sometimes it's better to ask people questions. Now, if you had somebody who is completely convinced, let's say you have a substitute teacher, and that substitute teacher is 100% convinced that you should do five hours of homework tonight. I know, right? But, but they are convinced. They are convinced, and they are not listening to any arguments. They are like, five hours, that's what we're going to do. What kind of questions might you ask that teacher? Yes, in the gray. Why, what makes you think five hours would be useful? And how about right behind? Yep, yep. Oh, what, so what evidence do you have that we need to do five hours? Sparkly red back there. Can you, can you review your assignments and maybe spread it out and put some of it tomorrow? Yep. How about you? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so like, have you learned to do math? <laughs> and, and in front there, with the long black hair. Yep. You. Why are, you, why are you so evil may not be a productive question, <laughs> but you can try. Yes. Oh, so have you, have you considered how much sleep we need and how, might, how would you suggest we balance our homework with our need for sleep? That would be a good question to ask. Yeah, have you thought of, is there any way we might be able to split this into different days? Okay, one more, yes. Could we do three hours today and two hours tomorrow? Yes. So I find in real life, debates are fun. Debates are really fun and really great ways to, I see somebody desperate to talk back there. Okay, what, what, what would you like to add? If, <laughs> if school isn't a place to sleep, then home isn't a place to study. Uh, <laughs> that's a good debate argument. You could throw that out in a debate. So debates happen all around us in, in real life. They happen in court when one lawyer gets up to say one side and another lawyer gets up to say another side and then a judge or a jury have to decide. They happen in politics where one politician says one thing and the other politicians argue and then they yell at each other on the news. Um, they happen in the newspaper where one journalist might say the argument for one thing and then the argument for another thing. So debates do happen all around us. But also in real life, it can be really stressful sometimes just to be arguing with people all the time. So sometimes when you have disagreements in real life, the other option is to ask questions. Asking questions. For example, if your parents wanted to, you to eat vegetables that you, didn't want to, that, didn't, that you didn't want to eat and they said, you have to sit at the table until all these vegetables are gone, you might ask, hmm, well, hey, dad, were there any foods that you hated when you were a kid? Did your parents make you eat them? Oh, do you like those vegetables today? And these questions might be effective because research says one of the number one predictors of whether kids like vegetables is whether their parents like vegetables. So your dad might secretly not like that vegetable either. So sometimes in real life, asking questions can be the best way to convince people of things. Now, I wanted, I've got one more minute I wanted to talk about, and then I'm going to move on, and you can ask some questions from me. But, okay, here's what, in your... In your chair, 
I want you to sit for just a second in your chair like you're really exhausted. How would you sit in your chair? Oh. How would you sit in your chair if you were really mad? How would you sit in your chair if you were really stressed? How would you sit in your chair if you were in love? How would you sit in your chair if you were like kind of excited about what was about to happen? <laughs> okay. The, the, tell me, wh I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some imitations. You tell me which would be the best way to debate. Would it be the best to debate like this? How about like this? How about like this? No. How about like this? Yes, yes. If you're, if you're debating and you're posing your argument, you want to look interested and maybe a little bit excited and you want to get people involved, you want to make eye contact with them. You probably don't want to look like really stressed or tired or really in love. You got you to gotta stand up straight and look a little bit excited. And that's, the, that's one of the big keys to successful debating. Okay, that is a lot of stuff about arguing and debating and questions. And now, it is your turn to ask questions. So you can ask questions about the stuff we've been talking about if you want, but you can also ask questions about writing books and publishing books, and I am happy to answer any of those. And yes, in the Minnie Mouse shirt. Am I able to show the, mm, there was, yes. The question is, can I show what it looks like inside the book? And the inside of the book looks like this. So on one side of every spread is, is one side of the argument, and then the other side of the spread is the other side of the argument. And then it goes, through, each chapter goes through some spreads like that, and it has a, a final page that says, like, which do you decide? And it sort of summarizes the points on each side. But it doesn't tell the right or wrong answer. Yeah? Are we selling the book? Yes, there's books for sale outside after the, after the talk. Yes. Yes. They are twenty dollars. <laughs> they are. They. Um, you can also find this book at your uh, at your public library and probably soon at your school library. Anybody else have questions? Yes, in the blue. How long does it take to make? It usually takes me four to six months to write a book. This one had a lot of research in it, so probably more like six months. And then I send my manuscript into an editor who's a little bit like your English teacher, who makes red marks all over it, basically, and tells me what I did wrong. And says, no, nah, this paragraph doesn't make sense, and can you add more stuff here, and can you put chapter two before chapter one, and then I make all those changes. So that takes a few months, and we go back and forth. And then it goes to the illustrator to draw the pictures, and the illustrator does a lot of work, so that takes a few more months. It goes to a graphic designer who puts the illustration and the text together on the page and who makes a fancy cover. Then it goes off to a printer, usually in Asia, and then it floats back here on a boat, and that takes another three or four months. So from the time that I start writing to the time it comes out in a bookstore is usually at least a year and a half, sometimes two years. But my part is that first six months, really. How about you in the pink? Mm -hmm. um, so this one is more like a long chapter book. I do write some short picture books too, but this one is more like a chapter book. Um, yes, in the overalls. Um, how, many books have you published? how many books have I published? I think about 35 because I'm very old and I've been doing this for quite a long time. How about back there in the purple? How do you get a book to be published? 
The first thing you do is make your idea as perfect as possible. So if you're getting your first book published, you probably need to write the whole thing in advance. Then you need to show it to some friends and get comments on it and, and put it in a drawer for a few weeks and then read it again to see what mistakes you find and make it as perfect as you can. And then you can start sending it off to publishers and a lot of them will say, oh no, sorry, we're not publishing any books about kangaroos this year. Um, but then, maybe, if you keep trying and keep trying, you find one publisher who says, I love kangaroo books. I would love to publish this book. Um, but for most people, it takes a lot of tries before they find a publisher who, who gets really excited about their book. Yes? Um, what's your favorite book that you've written? My favorite book that I have published is a book called Maya's Strategy to Save the World because when my daughter was in grade seven, she really, really, really wanted a cell phone and she did everything to get a cell phone. She washed dishes and did all these laundry and chores. She babysat for the neighbors trying to save up enough money and her dad and I kept saying, no, you can't have a cell phone. No, you can't have a cell phone. And she said, what if I'm in grade 12 and I'm the only person in my class without a cell phone? And her dad said, the only person? Yeah, the only person. In your whole class? In my whole class. And he said, I guess you'll be the only person without a cell phone. And then she basically like disintegrated and slid under the breakfast table. Um, so I, I this, the, the ways she was trying to get a cell phone and the other things that were happening at school were so entertaining that I started writing them down and a lot of it became my strategy to save the world. Um, it's, sometimes it's very embarrassing to have a mom who is a writer. Yes? Are there any books that I've made that I haven't published that I've finished? Do you mean books like that I've made and never published or books that aren't published yet? Yes, I have written books that I have written the whole book and then nobody wanted to publish them and I put them in a drawer. Um, not recently, but when I was starting out, I consider them practice books. Yes, and most writers I think have some practice books that are hiding in a drawer somewhere. Yes. My first book came out in 2001 and I was working for a publishing house. I, I started working after university for a publishing house and I, they happened to need somebody to write a book and I was like, pick me, pick me. So I wrote my first book for that publishing house that I was working for and then I started working for other publishers as well. Yes? What if you just wanted to publish a book on your own and donate all the profits to charity? Is that the question? Yeah, you can definitely do that, and people do. They hire their own editor, and they hire their own graphic designer, and maybe they sell it on Amazon, and then they can either keep the profits or they can donate it the profits. That's called self-publishing, and definitely people, people do it more and more, and they do very well at it. So many questions. How about you? Me? Yes. <laughs> my, my daughter wins all the debates. <laughs> my, did I win the debate to get Instagram or did my daughter? Um, I think my daughter won the Instagram debate in grade eight and then and my son just um, benefited from her arguments. Yes. Oh, I discovered that I loved writing in grade five because we wrote books, we wrote stories in class, and then we designed covers for them, and then my teacher got them bound so they looked like books, and I just thought that was the best thing ever. And then in grade 11, there was a new teacher at my school who started a creative writing class, and so I took creative writing in grade 11 and 12. I went to a very small high school. There were only four people in my creative writing class, but it was my favorite class ever. And that teacher said, you know, you can take writing at university, and so that's what I went off to do. Yes? What was the first book you wrote? The first book I wrote was called Canadian Girls Who Rock the World, and it was all about girls who did amazing things before they turned 20. And then there was a Canadian Boys Who Rock the World that came out after it as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that part where you were talking about like, like publishing, oh, well, I was very fortunate in that I was working for the publishing house when I when I published my first book. But later there were definitely books that got rejected. Um, 
Some of them got rejected by quite a few different places. Sometimes, once I, kept, once I had a spreadsheet that had like all the rejections listed, and that was a bad idea, so then I just stopped counting. <laughs> it's better, sometimes better not to think too much about them. But I've had plenty. The, the thing about writing is sometimes you get to make these amazing books and share stories with a whole bunch of people, and it's super exciting, and the price for that is sometimes you get your ideas rejected. And I feel like that's the way I think about it, is that that's the price for sometimes getting to share your ideas with thousands of people, and that makes me feel better about the rejection part. Yes? What should grade fives be doing to become, become better writers? What should grade fives be doing to become better writers? The first thing is to read tons. And I would say read all sorts of things. So don't only read what you already know you love, but read lots of different things and discover as mu many different things. And then writing is like everything else. Writing is like doing push-ups. If you don't do any push-ups and then you have to do push-ups, it's really hard. But if you do like a few push-ups every day, push-ups become easier. Writing is a muscle like anything else. So the more you write, the easier it gets. The more your ideas flow, the easier it gets to put them down on the page. So those two things. Yes, in the very back. Yeah. The best book I've ever read? This is always such a hard question, the best book I've ever read. My, the best book I've ever written. Oh, OK. Well, I like my strategy to save the world. The other one I really liked was one called When the Worst Happens. And it's all about survival situations. So with plane crashes and boats sinking and, and how people survived. And I liked it best because I am a very paranoid person. So when I get on an airplane, I watch the safety demonstration really carefully in case we crash. And when I get on, even when I get on BC ferries, I'm like the only person on the whole ferry that listens to the safety announcements. Um, but researching this book about how some people manage to survive in these extreme circumstances made me feel like maybe I would be, a, I could be a little bit better at it. So, and plus it's all survival stories, so it was really exciting. So that's called When the Worst Happens. That was one of my favorites. See, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I see a couple in the corner back there. How, yeah. Do I write grand? I write novels, some for teenagers, and but mostly for like eight to thirteen year olds. I've never written a graphic novel. I've written little bits of of like comic strips to go in some of my nonfiction, but I've never written a whole graphic novel. I do think they're very fun and very cool. So it might be on my list for one day things to do. How about you in the back, in the black? Mm-hmm. Um, the books out there are not signed, but I will be here for a few minutes to sign books if you want them signed. And okay, last two questions over there. <laughs> Can you say that again? Does it also count with the hungry? Do you mean um, reading different books? Yeah. yeah, for sure. The Hunger Games counts. Of course it does. Uh, last question. Is this my newest book? Um, I have a picture book for little kids out called Bompa's Insect Expedition, and it's all about David Suzuki taking his grandkids on an expedition to find insects. So that is my new official newest book, but that is for mostly for young. That, if you have little brothers and sisters, that would be for them. So this is my newest book for, for this age group. You have all been amazing debaters. Thank you very much for coming today, and thank you for participating so well. Um, I think Lauren has a few things to say to us before we go. Um, thank you so much. Don't forget to complete the online feedback form, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Tanya.